surviving prison. Uh, Rules for surviving prison. Uh, True Crime Magazine. I don't know if this is a legit thing or not, or if this will really help you if you ever find yourself in prison. Um, But it's, they said, these rules for uh, for surviving prison were written by a a real ex-con, a guy who had survived. So it's better than any rules I'm going to give you. But here he goes. He says, number one, respect other inmates. That sounds like a good idea. I mean, I don't know, but Number two, stay out of gangs. I had thought uh, mistakenly that you wanted uh, to, you know, get in a group that would support you. But they said, no, find some friends, but stay out of gangs, they're trouble. Number three, don't do drugs. I I like that one. Don't gamble. Again, good. Don't snitch. Stay busy with healthy activities. These all seem like normal, like, good living guidelines to me, to be honest. Right? Uh, Respect people. Stay out of gangs. Don't do drugs. And the last one he wrote on here was, um, get God in your life. It's it's good. That's good. Um, The reason I looked this up and the reason I'm sharing these with you is not, uh, well, I'm hoping none of you will end up in prison. In case you do, though, there you go. You got something already. Uh, But um, the reason I brought this up is because our story today has to do with Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas um, are early first century missionaries. Paul actually... Uh, his thing was to take the gospel of Jesus to um, around the world to people that weren't Jews, to Gentiles all over. And he took uh, three big road trips, sharing the gospel all over the Mediterranean area and telling people about Jesus. And on this particular story, in Acts chapter 16, we're going to find out that Paul and Silas, um, as a result of their ministry, find themselves in a Philippian jail. So let's read this together. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks for all you've done, for all you're going to do. We thank you for your presence here in this place, and we invite you, Lord, to speak to our hearts. We make space in our thoughts, we make space in our mind, we make space in our heart, Lord, for you to do what you want to do in us. Lord, make us a blessing today. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Okay, so how did Paul end up in jail? How did Paul and Silas end up in jail? This is what's going on. They're on a road trip. They left their families behind. They left their jobs. They, left their reputa- they, they put their reputation on the line to spread this new thing, this, the story of Jesus, in places that hadn't heard before. And so they're on this road trip, And they find themselves in Philippi. Now, Philippi is a city that was founded for the purpose of controlling some gold mines. So, like, the purpose of this town, the people who are there, they're trying to to make some wealth. And so, Paul and Silas have made some inroads in the the city already. There's this lady named Lydia. She says she's a seller of purple goods. I actually, we happened to be in this Bible reading with my family last night, and uh, we read Lydia uh, And said, seller of purple goods, and my daughter loves purple. And she's like, ha ha, that's funny, (laughs) purple. (laughs) Well, the reason that's important and that's in the Bible is that purple was an expensive uh, luxury at that time. And so what that means is that Lydia was uh, a merchant who was making some good money, and she was kind of influential. So Paul and Silas were making some inroads into the culture in Philippi. And... um, there was this young lady, and it says, it says that um, Luke, calls, Luke says that she was possessed by what um, is called a spirit of divination. A spirit of divination. Uh, she could see things in the spirit that some of us couldn't, and it was not good for her. It was not good. This is not a, this is not a gift 
sort of a curse. It was a demonic influence in her life. And so, and this is very bad. I mean, it's affecting her in probably all kinds of bad ways. But she was a slave, and her owners liked it because they could use her as sort of a fortune teller. And so they were making money off of what was a horrible thing for her life. But anyway, this young lady's following them, and she's, she's yelling out to the crowds. She's yelling out, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. So this demon that's in her sees these guys and understands what they are, and she's proclaiming it. I don't understand how all that works, but this demon is telling the truth. And after a while, uh, this goes on for many days, apparently it becomes disruptive to the ministry. So Paul turns around and he says, okay, it's time. And he looks at her right in the eye, and he speaks directly to the demon, and he says, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And within one hour, she's set free, and her life is changed. And she's set free from this demonic influence, free to live her life the way she wants, free to live her life free of this demonic um, bondage. Praise God. We serve a God who's able to do this. Now, he speaks directly at her. It's gone. Now, she's pleased. Probably her family's ecstatic. Um, Paul and Silas are no longer annoyed. uh, But there are some people who are. Now the owners are annoyed because now they can't gain uh, money off of this thing that she had, right? So they grab Paul and Silas. They take them uh, to the city magistrates and say, hey, these guys are Jews, which was uh, derogatory. These guys are Jews, and they're trying to teach customs that are um, not good for Romans. And so the city magistrates say, well, we can't have that. I guess this is swift justice. They quickly beat them and throw them in jail. Um, this jail in Philippi is not a nice place. Um, so it says that they put their feet in stocks. And so um, this, is a, this is more like a dungeon. It's dark, it's dirty, it's damp, and there's probably rats running around. And um, when they put their feet in stocks, I read, that means that they were, their legs were spread far apart. Now, I get grumpy when I'm not sleeping in my own bed. I can't imagine sleeping on a hard floor with my legs spread, locked in place, spread apart. It would be awful. It'd be awful. So point number one, what I want you to remember from this passage is this. Obedience to the Lord is often met with opposition. When you decide to sign up and follow Jesus, and I don't just mean, I don't just mean, okay, I'm, I'm going to be a member and I'm going to show up to church, but when you decide to let Jesus speak into your life, and when he says, you go, you go. And when he says, speak this to your friend, you speak this to your friend. And when he says, whatever he says, when he directs you, when you decide, I'm going to follow Jesus, no matter where he takes me, no matter what he asks of me, you're going to find that the more you do that, obedience to the Lord is often met with opposition. Following Jesus is great in an Indiana Jones kind of way. Like, it's not great like, oh, all these blessings are going to flow on me immediately because I decided to follow Jesus. This is not why we do this, right? Right? It's a, uh, it's a big adventure. There's lots, of ra- there's lots of risks. Following Jesus is great in a strap your boots on, roll up your sleeves, and let's get to it kind of way. Because we've been given this great big job that's bigger than any of us. We've been given this great commission that says we're supposed to take this gospel that God came from heaven to earth in the form of a baby. He put on human flesh. He took on our sins. He, gave us the, he came to set the oppressed free, to heal the sick, and to restore relationship with humanity and mankind. He died and he rose again, and now we get to have a relationship with him. Come on. Now that message, that message changes the world. When you understand that we're all sinners and we, need re- and we need God and we need redemption, that has the power to change the world. We like to focus on all kinds of things that might change the world. We like to t- talk about laws and we like to talk about politics and we like to talk about education and we like to talk about growing wealth. and we like- All of these things are great, nothing wrong with them. But the thing that's going to change the world, you guys, is this message that Jesus sets us free from our sin and we can have a relationship with God only through him. That's it. So we've been given this job. We've been given this job. Where there's hurting people, we're supposed to step up. Where there's people being oppressed, we're supposed to step in. Where people don't know Jesus, we get to go be Jesus to them. Maybe you thought, maybe you're here, and you're thinking about signing up with the Jesus thing. Before you do, before you do, you need to make sure you understand 
It's not about amusement parks and picnics and potlucks. It's not about that. It's more like Paul and Silas. It's more like Paul and Silas. We're hounded by demon, he hounded by demon possessed young lady, falsely accused, beaten in jail. And why? Because I left my family to follow Jesus and tell people about uh, tell people about him. Oh yeah, and I set the I I we I was able to cast this demon out of this young lady. So now I'm in jail. It's more like that. Now that's not the end of the story, don't worry. But you have to be ready for the trouble. Because there's going to be trouble. There's going to be opposition. Paul and Silas weren't surprised, and neither should we be, because Jesus warned us in John chapter 16. He said, in the world, you will have tribulation. I don't know how to say it any more clearly, right? Jesus was good at cutting to the quick. He said, in the world, you will have trouble, but take heart. Why? I have overcome the world. In Luke 19, he said, he said to all the people, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's what it means to follow Jesus. To deny yourself, don't forget that part. To take up your cross, that sounds like fun. And then you're in a position to follow Jesus. That's what it takes. That's what it takes. Matthew 5.11, Jesus says, and this is the famous Sermon on the Mount, right in the middle of all those blessed beatitudes, he says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. Oh, sounds so good. And utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. Oh, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Basically, Jesus asks us to pick up our our cross and promises in return trouble and persecution in this life. Basically, that's that's the deal. But he also promises never to leave. Like Paul and Silas, the closer you get to making breakthroughs for the kingdom, the harder you follow, the more you can expect opposition. It's important you understand that. It's important you understand it. Because when you meet the opposition, now you won't shrink. You'll understand. You won't shrink away from it. You'll understand this is what God has, and he's going to make a way. So the question at this point has to be, what will you do when your walk with Christ becomes inconvenient or downright dangerous? You need to ask yourself this question before you take the next step with Jesus, wherever that is, wherever you are on your journey with Jesus, you you need to ask yourself, what are you going to do when what he asks you looks like too much? What are you going to do when you follow Jesus and you thought you knew where it was going to go, but it ended up in a world of trouble? Because it does sometimes. Are you going to trust him and continue with him? Or are you going to say, "Eh, that's not what I signed up for. Well, let's be clear. Jesus made it clear what you were signing up for. Trouble and persecution. It is. He'll never leave you. I'll get to that in a minute. Don't worry. But you've got to expect trouble. You've got to expect opposition, right? Okay, we got that clear. The next thing I want you to remember we know that following Jesus is sort of asking trouble, but, we're wait, but wait, but are, are we ready? Number two, you need to know that God gives you all that you need. When you're in trouble, God gives you all that you need. All that you need. So you will be lacking in nothing necessary. However, it might not be what you thought it was going to be. You will be lacking in nothing that you need, but it might not be what you thought it was going to be. We find ourselves in trouble. <clears throat> I should make this personal. When I find myself in trouble, often the natural responses flow. Um, things like, why me? Why in the world did this happen? God, you told me to do this. Why am I here in this point right now? Where is God? This isn't fair. When my kids were little, they, that was one of their favorite questions. How many of your kids ask this question it's, or, or say, it's not fair, it's not fair? Anybody? Hey, I'll give you a parenting tip right now. This is like my best parenting moment. I taught my kids, you want what's fair? <clears throat> and they go, well, what's fair? And I start going, well, then you can take out the trash and wash the dishes and pay. I made the list of fair and they, they stopped asking. It's really good. 
That's just for free and not on topic, so let's come back. All right, <clears throat> so God gives us all we need. One of the things he gives us, and probably one of the most vital things he gives us in trouble, see, we like to ask for things like, um, God, deliver me. We like to ask for things like, um, God, I don't want to suffer anymore, or God, um, you know, whatever the thing is. We want out of the b- bad situation. One of the best things God gives us, though, is strength and his presence in the situation. Amen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're hired. Next service. <clears throat> oh, really? Um, one of the best things he gives us in our time of trouble is not rescue or, or removing us from the, from the trouble, although he's able, and often he does, and, is, and can, but, but the best thing he does for us is he gives us trouble, and his, I mean, he gives us strength and his presence in the situation. Paul and Silas, they didn't wallow in pity, although I would have, although they could have. I mean, it was a legit gripe, right? They didn't do that. They didn't blame God. You know, uh, probably what would have happened with me, honestly, if, if we would have ended up in jail together, I would have blamed you. <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, could it, probably it would have gone, like my, if I was Silas, I probably would have gone, Paul, I told you to leave that girl alone. I told you, I told you. If you would have just left her alone, we'd have been fine. No, they didn't do that. Paul and Silas didn't respond in the natural. Listen, they didn't have the natural response. They understood that the problem wasn't the slave. The problem wasn't the slave owners. They didn't have a city magistrate problem. They didn't have a jailer problem. Their problem wasn't even the very bonds that were on their wrists and hands and the door that was keeping them locked in. What they had was a supernatural problem. And when you have a super pro- supernatural problem, what you need is a supernatural answer. When you have a supernatural opposition, what you need is a supernatural redeemer. That's what you need. And so they knew what to do. They knew that when you have a supernatural problem, you need a supernatural response. Paul and Silas knew the one that they needed to call, and they knew how to get in touch with him. When, um, when my son Caleb, who you see sing a lot up here, um, when my son Caleb, he's 16 now, when he was in middle school, he would, um, and I think this is not just Caleb, because I have two other boys, and they have the similar issues, but this is what happens a lot in middle school. They kind of get sullen. Does that ever happen to your middle school boys? They kind of just get kind of moopy, and nothing you say is okay, Right? And then other people come around and they're like, hi. Well, I don't know. It's just parents. But um, anyway, so he was going through this phase in the mornings. And um, it was my job to get him to school. And he had to be at school at 630 in the morning. Neither one of us are morning people. When you, (laughs) Callie. (laughs) Callie and I share an office and she just said amen, kind of. Uh, Anyway, so she. So he said, um, so we're both neither one of us morning people. And when you get two morning people having to get someplace in the morning together who aren't morning people, um, you can kind of rub each other the wrong way. So anyway, um, he got into this habit of just not talking to me. Like we'd get in the car and I didn't have to be up for another two hours. But we're on our way to school and I'm saying, so what you got today? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what? what um, what, 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 what scenes are you rehearsing this morning? <sighs> and then he'd get out of the car, and he'd close the door and just walk off. And I'd say, I'd say, bye, Caleb. And he'd go, <sighs> and walk off. I'm like, I don't, I don't speak. <sighs> I don't know what you're saying to me, and I'm very frustrated right now. Um, so, so, the ne- so I got an idea. The next day, I said, okay, Caleb, um, Here's the thing. You don't have to talk to me all the way to school. But when you get out of the car, you have to say this one thing to me. Dad, thank you for the ride. And then you can go. And that's it. That's it. That's all I want. I don't know. Maybe I'm selfish. But my heart needed it. <clears throat> so, <laughs> so I said, all right. That's the request. So the next, he goes, 
okay. And I got the middle school eye roll. And he walked in the house. So the next morning we get in the car and I'm, we're driving. And I, do, I, do, I purpose in my heart, I'm not going to ask him any questions. I'm not going to say anything. We drive all the way there. He opens the door and I said, hey, Caleb. He looks back. He says, I said, <laughs> I said, goodbye. He said, <laughs> and walks off. <laughs> so I rolled down the window and all of his friends are walking in. <laughs> I let him get about 10 feet away. And I said, hey, Caleb, I love you, baby. <laughs> you have a great day at school. And Jesus loves you. You are special to me. Well, well, the next day, he opens the door. He says, thank you for the ride, Dad. <laughs> Walks in the school. <laughs> I, I have a confession that doesn't have much to do with anything. I just need to say... I have this confession. I enjoy torturing my children. <laughs> it's, not, it's not nice. Pray for them. <laughs> so many stories. <clears throat> Sometimes I think that we walk through life, though, and we kind of get um, that attitude where we forget the blessing. And we forget that we're supposed to say thank you. We forget sometimes where we've come from and that it is perfectly within God's right. It's perfectly within his sovereignty to leave us on our own. But he promised not to, and instead, he takes care of us day by day. This breath I just took is only because he let me. And everything that flows from it, it all comes from him. I think sometimes we forget we're supposed to be thankful. Paul and Silas didn't forget. They're in jail. They could have wallowed. They could have cried. They could have pitched a fit. Instead, what they said was, I know the one. And they called on him in the right way. It says they prayed and they worshiped. And you know what time it was? It was midnight. You know, we got worship nights here at 6 o'clock. And some of y'all are like, oh, no, it's kind of late. They're in jail. I'm sorry, that, that was mean. Uh, <laughs> it's 6 o'clock. It's midnight. They're in jail. And they said, what should we do? I'd be like, I'm trying to sleep, Paul. Will you please shut up? Paul goes, no, we're going to have a worship night. And they start singing and they pray. And you know what? It must have been pretty good because the prisoners, and the, it says the other prisoners were listening. They were listening. They knew they had a supernatural problem. They needed a supernatural answer. This isn't just, this, this, their, their worship and their prayer was not just natural. It wasn't natural. In fact, it was kind of crazy. The enemy must have thought at this point, what do I have to do to these guys to shut them up? The enemy at this point must have said, what in the world do I have to do to you to get you to be quiet, to get you to stop telling, telling about Jesus, to stop proclaiming his name. I've locked you down here in a dark, dank jail. jail. I beat you up, and you're still going to do this. He must be really frustrated. But Paul and Silas' worship wasn't conditional, as sometimes mine is. They, say, he, they didn't say, when things are good, then I'll start praising you. They didn't say, when you get me out of this mess, I'll start praising you. You know what? Paul and Silas praised God in the middle of the trouble. And here's the miracle part. For the trouble. They praised God in the middle of the trouble for the trouble. Because they knew they were never in a moment outside his care. And they already understood this concept that Paul puts out later, 
that, that he works everything together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So they were able to look at the very rat, the very bondage, the leak dripping on their head, and say, God, thank you, because I know. I know you're working this for my good. I know you are. No matter what, I'll praise you. No matter what. When I'm winning, I'm going to praise you. When I'm losing, I'm going to praise you. He's worthy of our praise when I'm surrounded by friends and when I'm lonely. He's worthy of my praise when I'm up or when I'm down. He's worthy of my praise when I'm surrounded by victory and when I've been utterly defeated. He's still worthy. Like Paul and Silas, we should determine to praise God in the middle of the trouble, for the trouble. So here's the question. What will it take you, what will it take to make you stop praising him? There's an enemy who wants to shut you up, who wants to shut you down. And he's going to do whatever he can to do that. What's it going to take to make you be quiet? Stop and think for a minute. Have you allowed a circumstance in your life, some bitterness, some hurt, something in the past to slow down your praise, to put a cap on it? Have you allowed it to separate you from him? Is there something in your life that would turn your heart from engaging the creator in worship? So, God gives us, God gives us um, inner strength and his presence in a time of trouble. And you know what else? He also gives us his power. He doesn't just give us the strength to make it through. He is constantly redeeming his people. There's always a second part of the story. While Paul and Silas' worship was unconditional, it was the worship that put them in a receive, in, 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 and the prayer that put them in a position to receive God's best for them. It was the ignition, I think, for God's miracle that he had already prepared. God already had made a way and knew what he was going to do. He was ready to rumble the earth and make that, sh- and make that earthquake, make that jail pop open. He was ready to do it. It was Paul and Silas' heart of prayer and worship that was the ignition for that miracle. There are three miracles. First, the earthquake and their freedom. Second, second and this is beautiful. Uh, my favorite part, my favorite line in that whole scripture that we read, my favorite line was this one. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know what happened after that? <clears throat> he said, believe in Jesus. He did. And he took, him to, they, he took them out to, the, to his family. He fed them. He cleaned them up. And their whole house gave their heart to Jesus. And they all decided to follow Jesus. That's a miracle. And then, the next day, the sun comes up. The leaders of the town, after having slept in their comfortable bed, after having eaten dinner, eaten breakfast, they get together and they say, you know what, send a message, that was probably enough. We beat them, they spent the night in jail, that's enough, they'll probably be quiet now. So they just sent word to let them out. Well, you know what Paul says? Paul says, wait a minute. He says, you publicly beat us. You publicly beat us, and then you threw us in jail. And you know what? You didn't even ask. We're Roman citizens, so you didn't have the right to do it. Now listen, this is a problem. This is a problem for the, for the magistrates. And so what they do immediately, you know what they do? Immediately, they head down to the jail, and they say, um, sorry. <laughs> you think, that, I, I'd say, you bet your bippy you're Sorry. They say, they say, they say, sorry, um, would you please leave town now? <laughs> and Paul and Silas say, okay, um, listen, I appreciate that. But before I leave town, I'm going to go visit my friends. So, and then they go and visit Lydia. They hang out for a bit, say goodbye to the church, and then they go on their way. Listen, when we follow Jesus this way, when we follow Jesus and obey him this way. What happens? 
what happens is that he can, it gives him an opportunity to work miracles, and it will raise us up. He will even raise us up in the view of those around us. God was working all these things together in a way that no one could have foreseen. In just a minute, Caleb and Tracy, would you guys come? Caleb's going to sing a song. This last point I need to tell you, this is advanced Christianity and not for the faint of heart. Some of you might have been already like, oh, slow it down. This is the good one, though. The last thing I want you to hear is this. God saves us not to give us a blessing, but God saves us to make us a blessing. God saves us not to give us a blessing, but God's purpose in saving us is to make us a blessing. So many times it seems we spend our time with God looking and asking for a blessing. Paul and Silas weren't in the jail because they were looking for a blessing. And I think sometimes we miss the big payoff because we're way too focused on our own self-centered victories. I, the part of the story that really is strange to me, listen, the, the doors pop open, the bonds come off, you know what I do next? Boom! <laughs> I mean, that has to be God's answer, right? I'm, I'm gone. I'm out the door. God just set me free from my bonds. It makes sense, right? What doesn't make sense is sitting there and waiting for the jailer to come back. What were, the, what were they thinking? Paul and Silas are different. They were praying, and they were worshiping, and their heart was in tune with God, and they knew there was something bigger about to happen. There was something bigger coming. Sometimes when I'm focused on my own blessing, I grab for the small opportunity and make a run for it. But when I'm fully trusting Jesus, then I make space for God to move. If you're looking for a blessing, if you're looking for your blessing, then you'll be disillusioned when you don't get it. And you'll be traumatized when you encounter any kind of trouble or, or opposition. But if you're looking, if you shift from looking for blessing to looking to be a blessing, then you find a world of opportunity because you can be a blessing a thousand times a day. There's a, you come into contact with hundreds of hurting people every week. There are people in your neighborhood who don't have enough to eat. Maybe not your neighborhood. A neighborhood nearby who don't have enough to eat. You can find a thousand blessings. All you got to do is choose one. They are plentiful. If you're looking to be a blessing, you'll find a world of opportunity. And the other part is when you come, when trouble comes, you'll already lean in into God. So you'll lean in more with an expectation of what he's getting ready to do. Sometimes, if you're looking for a blessing, it's like you want the power of God, but you're not looking for the obedience and the sacrifice part. That's kind of like you want God to be a genie. God, I want this and I want this and I want that. Amen. But when you shift your focus outside, then we understand that what we need to do is trust and obey God, who's been proven trustworthy. It's a shift in power and control from us to him. It's a shift in focus from us to others. If you'll give him control, he will never let you down. He'll never let you down. So the question here is, will you allow God space in your life for trouble? Or will you run from trouble so hard that he can't do it? Will you allow, will you allow God trouble space in your life so he can show himself faithful and strong and good? Will you allow him that space or will you always be running? No matter how strong the opposition comes, we can trust that he's stronger. No matter how deep the pit, we always know he can rescue. No matter how bleak the situation, he's trustworthy. The conclusion is no matter what, he's worthy. These were our questions. What will you do when, you walk, when your walk with Jesus becomes inconvenient or dangerous? What will it take to make you stop praising him? And will you allow God trouble in your life, trouble space in your life, so he can show himself faithful and strong?